Hello, boys. Welcome to Trends with Friends. We're, uh, well, good friends talking about trends. How about that? We had a week off first Oktoberfest. Welcome back, everybody. Um, on my right, well, I don't even know how this works, but on my right, special guest today, my friend uh, Pranav, uh, who runs crypto liquid funds at Van Eck. I am an LP, full disclosure. And I'm looking at my statement, and it's up. That's why Pranav is a guest. Uh, we don't have guests. Uh, so so uh, thank you, Pranav, and welcome. The, uh, I've probably you. already broke, I've probably broken seven SEC rules. So uh, Pranav goes, you got to disclose everything. And <laughs> I'm, a size, I'm a size 33 waist. Uh, I have an eating problem. And some days I like Phil, some days I don't. Okay, full disclosure. Uh, Done. Uh, to his right, the AI whisperer. Uh, it was fun to see him in person uh, last week, uh, Michael Parekh. Uh, below Michael in baby blue, wearing it better than I wear my royal blue. Um, still with his bullish haircut gelled to the right, uh, upward to the right. Uh, JC we'll Perez, welcome. Howard. I don't know what you want from me. It's not my fault. I'm kind of excited to see a downtrend just to see how your hair looks going the other way. Look at Bonds. But- Bonds are a downtrend. <laughs> That's the back of your hair is to the downward to the right. And then Phil. Can't part his hair since birth uh, and going with the white hoodie. Uh, and somehow, even though you've only been up an hour, it's dirty. So I don't know where you've been gardening or something, but uh, welcome, Phil. So take over, Phil. We got a lot to cover today. Uh, it was uh, I'm kind of worn out from Stocktoberfest. We got Pranav, special guest. We got Bitcoin at all time highs, election next week, betting markets, uh, Philip Moore. There's everything. Gold. Uh, you start, Phil. What do we got? So first up, I just want to give a shout out to StockTwits. This is earnings. Earnings is kicking in like crazy this week. You got Google up this afternoon. You got Apple. You got Amazon. You got all of these big tech reporting. And StockTwits now, in with one click, you can listen to the uh, earnings call and you can also get in the chat which is not censored. So there's a lot of good information and there's a lot of good uh, shit talking going on in there. It's just a great vibe. I hop in there all the time, especially on the tech earnings. And we got a bunch of big ones up this week. Meta, I forgot to say that one. So definitely check that out. This screenshot I took from this morning, the SoFi call, the PayPal call, the McDonald's call all going on. It's great. It's a great vibe. It's great time in there. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about earnings. Let's let's just get right into that. Speaking of earnings, on tap this week, we figure we get a little just look at some of the charts and how things are lining up, what risk rewards look like from some of the big tech. And so maybe JC could take us through that. Pranav, we're going to get to uh, talking about crypto in the election in about 10 minutes and also stable coins and also a little helium cha-cha, which is going crazy, by the way. Um, we're going to get to that. But first, we're just going to do a quick touch on technicals for the big tech that are reporting this week. JC, let's start with Google. What do you got there? Well, <clears throat> I mean, listen, when you when you look at some of these names, the way I like to look at it is how are they doing relative to the prior cycle's peak, right? So that 21 period where Bitcoin peaked and Amazon peaked and NVIDIA and a lot of technology, where are these companies relative to that moment in time? When you look at the S&P 500 components, we have the most amount of S&P 500 stocks that are now above those prior cycle's peak, right? We track that because that's a key up. Uh, point so was uh 2018 by the way early 2018 we also pivot to that so was the fourth quarter of this year as a matter of fact and what you'll find is we have the most amount of stocks in the s p 500 that are above each of those peaks that we've had this entire bull market which is further evidence that breath has been expanding not deteriorating so i would take that whole thought process and focus in on the most important companies the biggest ones 
Uh, Alphabet is already above those prior cycles peak. Uh, Facebook is already above the prior uh, cycles highs. Uh, you could look at something like Amazon, for example, which is, is slide 13 here. And, and Amazon has not broken out above those highs. So when I look at a name like that, I want to think about what are its cousins doing? What are its brothers and sisters doing? What are the other names that are in, in these categories? When they get back to those former highs, how have they reacted? And one by one, to the point where the most desirable market have is ultimately exceeded those levels. So it's hard for me to make a bet that Amazon is not going to do that if all of the other ones are. Uh, same thing with Tesla, if you look at the next one. So Amazon represents 22% of the entire consumer discretionary sector, as it should. People are like, oh my God, it's so much. It, it probably should be more, right? If, if how much Amazon comes to my house is any indication. It, it's, and we buy everything there. Uh, what about Tesla? Tesla represents 15, 16% of the consumer discretionary sector. So for me, it's less about, and has been, less about what Tesla is doing specifically and all the fundamentals and more about the asset allocation into this particular group. Because if you look at the slide 12, this is it for me. This is everything. This is consumer discretionary relative to the rest of the market, potentially putting in a 10-year top in the middle of a bull market. So you can't have both. Consumer discretionary in a consumer-based economy is not gonna complete a massive 10-year base relative to the rest of equities if this bull market is gonna progress into 2025 and beyond. So you, they're either gonna step in and buy them or they're not. So when you look at the components of discretionary, Amazon being the leader, looking to complete this multi-year base that I think it does if all the other ones have been, Tesla's right in there with it, um, and, and, and down the chain from there uh, in retail and other things, automobiles and all of that other stuff. But I think it starts here. Michael. I just want to add, this is, that was great uh, from JC in terms of how these stocks are moving together, their brothers and sisters and cousins. But this group and the, the rest of the uh, Mag7s, et cetera, which will come out in the next few days, if, I, if we look at the AI story from a bottom-up, top-down over the last three months, the majority of the focus by investors has been on the investments, the AI capex on infrastructure that these companies are spending, you know, 10, 15, 20 billion dollars a quarter. And there's been a big debate on Wall Street, you know, where's the beef? When are we going to get money for this? It's, you know, revenues. And the reality is that the revenues always take several years beyond the capex. And this time, this tech wave, AI tech wave, we're spending probably three, four, five times the monies we've spent in previous tech waves two or three years earlier. And so that's been the focus. Having said that, going into this quarter, Meta especially, but Google, anyone that's advertising focus, Meta, Google, Amazon has a big uh, advertising piece. One of the things that I think is un uh, not as well understood is the AI is not just to make pretty pictures and all this content for users, which is amazing that, you know, agents and all this stuff. But the AI is being used aggressively for the advertisers, creating huge amounts of capability for advertisers to target uh, the, the huge amount of billions of people who are using Meta services, et cetera. Meta is going to be first and foremost. And I think we're going to see them show because they, Zuckerberg has been very aggressive about taking his best engineers and putting them on the advertising tool, AI generated advertising tools. And I think we're going to not just see, see numbers, but we're going to see conversation from the company on that. And that will also reflect on what Google has an opportunity because they are obviously the largest advertisers with the most AI compute and, and they're so focused on Gemini, et cetera. And it's going to mean good things, I think, for Amazon uh, as well, which uh, JC talked about. And since we've got the other two names, I'll just bring in Apple, which just launched this week. They're first of the Apple intelligence. We'll talk about more about that. But what I'm saying is all of this, there is a tailwind on the revenue product side of these companies that is just going to start to be talked about this quarter, and it's going to spill into the next few quarters. We'll have a lot more after the quarter, of course, on all of these. But I just wanted to point that out. Hey, uh, JC, can you give us, uh, you know, 30 seconds or a minute on this uh, other panel you have here, the Microsoft NVIDIA panel as well, like just, just what you're seeing. Microsoft's up this week. NVIDIA, for some reason, always reports a little bit later. 
But, I mean, look at that chart. It's just <clears throat> psychotic. It's incredible. Yeah, there's no question. I, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but it's good for the audience to know. Uh, but there's been a massive reweighting in the uh, S&P technology index. Before, it was Microsoft was 22%, Apple was 22%, and NVIDIA was like 4 or 5%. That was the case for a long time. Then earlier this year, they switched that. They switched Apple and NVIDIA. So NVIDIA became 20-something percent, like 21% of the uh, technology index. Microsoft was like 21% of the technology index. And then Apple fell to like five, right? And then quickly they changed that again to where today it is much more equally weighted where you're looking at Apple at 15, Microsoft at 13 and a half, and NVIDIA at 12 and a half. I think that's probably right. I think they got it right now and are more equally weighting those big three at about 40, 45% of the entire index. That's probably about right. But notice how Microsoft and NVIDIA are both above the prior cycle's highs, which to my earlier point, you're seeing more and more of these companies doing so. These obviously being uh, the most important in uh, the most important uh, sector, uh, technology, right? Uh, when you look at bull markets historically, technology is a leader in almost every single one, right? Like, so, you know, if, you're, if you think it's a bull market, then these are the types of stocks that should be leaders and doing well, and they have been. So we want to continue to look for that. Michael? Terrific uh, point. Again, I, I'll point out the obvious. NVIDIA is uh, basically is in a very good uh, spot, secular fundamentals, because they're the recipients of everyone else's expense for AI spend. The... Uh, the demand curve for that stretches out at least into the next six, probably eight quarters. Uh, NVIDIA has a big product ramp coming up with Blackwell chips, which are to 10 to 30 times more powerful on AI capabilities uh, launching in uh, in the first quarter of the of, of next year. And Apple, Microsoft, et cetera, are all going to be uh, spending on that, but benefiting from that in terms of capabilities. Why did they report so late? Do they just not give a shit because they're so badass? NVIDIA. Michael, just, why, that's, why? that's just when their quarter ends, but I don't know, Mike, is there a reason? I, I would suspect it's more uh, having to do with the chronology of the quarter sequencing, but I don't have more insight into I'm, I'm with Perlman. You know how, like, uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, reports on a Saturday because Warren Buffett's just the man, <laughs> you know? <It's> just... <laughs> I mean, I, just don't care. I don't. I don't know if we're going to talk about Google. I, I no, it's it's through. probably it's probably you know it takes longer to uh, dry clean Jensen's j j black jacket. Maybe that's yeah. the. I probably their, I, their calendar year ends on January thirty first, so their quarterly cycle is a month after everyone else. There we go. No, Thank you for enough. This audience hey, is big shot. I, Go ahead, Phil. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, Howie. I, I was just going to chime in on Google. I don't know if we're going to talk about it later. If I could chime in now and pull up a pull up a chart. The um, what interests me about Google right now is obviously it's lagging. I think we all know what we don't. If you know, you know, right? Like we all know search. If you don't know, you just got your head in the sand. Like I am late to this party, but it's obvious that search result, like just their search traffic, is going to drop. And I had a couple aha moments, but I'm also kind of rooting for a dip here because I think everybody must know. Um, that this is the game is up, and including Google, which just I think was just late to I think where OpenAI and Michael got right and and Sam Altman where where they got right is they just pulled I think they just found that killer use case before Google probably expected them to. So I think Google, Google got caught, you know, not lazy, but well maybe late, just unorganized. But like OpenAI snuck in there, just you know what I'm saying. Like the FTC is trying to do everything to stop these companies, and OpenAI just barge right through the hole. It's kind of like NFL football, where you see these guys are 400 pound line, and you go, "How could anybody ever run for 80 yards anymore again?" And then boom, the holes get bigger, and these guys explode faster. So OpenAI was just a, a like in normal circumstances, that's kind of a BlackBerry rim situation, but. You know, it, YouTube ain't going away in YouTube search. And then this Waymo, which, you know, Google's been known to give up on products, Michael, you know, from cable and, and you know, sports. Um, and with Waymo, with the $6 billion raise, uh, I think we now at least know that they're going to be around. I had an incredible Waymo moment just 
talking to my kids who use it and, you know, returning to Phoenix after about five, six months, which is a Waymo town and seeing just every other car on the road and this, you know, by the airport, every other Uber was a Waymo. Um, and just talking to people now that use Waymo, especially young women under 30, uh, they love it. Uh, I, I still can't mentally get over the control issues, but, but seeing it weave its way around an airport in five lanes just kind of blew my mind. Um, so that's not going away. It's going to push everybody. So I had to be the last guy to think autonomous driving was a thing. You know, you, Michael Marquez, some people that were way ahead of this curve have always believed. I think this summer was a huge leap forward. And now way, and now Google's in that play. The other thing about Google is Gemini, right? Uh, it a blow, I was blown away by my son. You know, I was driving home from the Suns game, uh, the home opener, and you know Phoenix is kind of sketch downtown at night. Uh, you can you can go pretty fast. It's pretty open town. And I was just driving forty ish miles an hour, and a guy just I don't know if he was drunk or or whacked out just just plunged in front of my car. No, he pulled up at the last second. No, you couldn't have seen him, and it was scary. And my wife's yelling at me as she does, uh, and says we could have gone to jail. And I said, honey, we're not going to jail. The guy was darted out in front of my car at full speed. Meanwhile, Max is in the back, chat GPTing. What is the liability of my dad running over a homeless person in the middle of the night? Like in his own, he would never have done this before. And he got an incredible, you know, instantly he's reading me back chat GPT's response to my liability if we had hit a guy. And, you know, this has opened up the curiosity and understanding for people who may not have been using Google search properly all these years. So for my son to have, have gone into Google search and done this type of question would have led to him having to read 10 links, uh, trying to decipher which one's important. Uh, and, um, just, just no interest in that subject. So I think that's a huge moment for me seeing ChatGPT work. And then with Gemini now, pretty much every search I do, guys, I see a Gemini at the top. And so they're eating their own, to their credit, and probably to the, to the, to the impending somewhat decline of the stock over the next few quarters, at least from people panicking. I'm saying if it does, it is people panicking that they don't, they're not going to recover. I know, Mike, you're shaking your head. What, what interests me here is they are now willing to bite off their arm finally and gemini is fantastic at least for me so just throw that out there to to pranav and michael yeah i out of several points if i may unpack very quickly on google gemini it is absolutely good enough relative to open ai and everybody else out there there's a topic about good enough good enough always wins in technology waves especially when it's tied to distribution. And there is no one like Google that has over 5 billion people Googling stuff, just like your son in the back of your car, everywhere in 100 plus languages. And AI, Gemini is built in, number one. Number two, Google has its own NVIDIA and uh, TPU processors, which are different from NVIDIA's. That's what drives all this. Compute is everything. To be able to do these AI-powered searches, you need huge processing. Google is numero uno after Microsoft in that capacity. And they, they are front of the line getting their chips made with TSMC. So they're pari passu with NVIDIA on that front. Number three, 10 billion searches done every day. I did have a huge post on Google on this last year, thinking saying basically Google wins the search thing over the next two or three years. They're doing huge work. They just rolled out this week uh, AI search overview to across dozens of countries uh, because they have the compute. OpenAI, Microsoft would give their left arm to do it. They don't have the compute. They don't have the processors to do it. Uh, Google can do it. The, then the big question for Wall Street, Howard, to your point, everyone is thinking algebraically. Oh, if Google search is going to be used less and AI search is going to be used more, there's less AI inventory. So ergo, Google's margins go down. Uh-uh. They may go down for a couple of quarters or a little bit, but as I said before, the smartest engineers are figuring out how to use the AI tools to help the advertisers advertise around the AI search. And if anyone's going to figure this out, 
Meta's going to figure this out, and Google's going to figure this out. So I think they we're going to be They have the Salesforce. I think, I think what people don't understand is they have the fucking Salesforce to do you, it. The like, Salesforce is just part of it. has got to build the Salesforce, and they got to build the no. UI for ads. If they think there's Go. not going to be ads in here, they're correct. in fucking smoke and crap. Correct, correct. But the biggest innovation. Helium. They could be no, smoking no, I, helium. I got they're it. eating they, the cats and dogs, and they're smoking helium. Yeah. But, Howard, it's it, a Salesforce is important. Like, I just one more. Just – Google innovated self-service advertising, which is incredible machine learning technology. They've been doing it for 10 years, which is what made Google, Google from a financial engine, just gusher of cash. So a lot of the AI-driven stuff is, again, self-service AI tools. So Salesforce's help, but literally are people, regular people who don't think of themselves as advertisers will say, I want this category. I want Pranav with a great haircut to be able to find content that's on, on my search, et cetera, the AI will figure it out for him. And that's where the, the profits are over the next few six years, uh, quarters. Enough. And Google is in a, as good yeah. a spot at that as anybody. Uh, to only play devil's advocate a lot of what you guys are saying, um, I've been a consumer of all these products in general, right? And mm -hmm. um, I used Perplexity for the first time man, know, six months ago. And I found that to be the most useful tool, more so than any, like, version of chat GPT. I've, I've used the old version of chat GPT. I've even used like notebook LM from Google, but from a productivity gain perspective, perplexity has got the most for me because it has the footnotes. It answers my questions. And um, the best one is the audio version. Cause I can be walking around and instead of listening to a podcast, I can be doing Q and a with perplexity, just learning. And I don't see how, if, if that, so it's the closest to a personal assistant that I've come across, which is kind of what everyone's trying to solve for, right? Like this like yep. AI personal assistant that's going to help you do a lot of stuff. Um, and I was waiting to see when Google, I mean, Google could very easily launch a competitor at some point. I just haven't seen one from them. So I'm like, they, they, they already they have not And have for 8 billion, if they tried to buy perplexity, would they, would the FTC break it up? And would you invest in perplexity yeah. at this 8 billion round? It sounds like yes, Pranav, yes. you would. Yeah, I, yeah I, love the I love Perplexity. Yeah. I love the product. I agree with Pranav. It's one of the best AI product companies, amazing management, one of the companies to watch. However, this cycle, you've got, we've got to understand mainstream markets versus early adopters. People like Pranav, me, etc. we will be spending our lives on Perplexity every day, uh, disproportionate amount. I love the product. I agree with you. But most of it can be copied and will be. Remember when Snapchat com comes out with stories and then F F Zuckerberg figures out how to basically introduce everything, stories, into they stuff it into Instagram, et cetera. But that's where they have the billions of users. Google's doing the same thing. If you look at Google's AI search overview, they may, it may not be as elegant as perplexity, but they are putting the footnote sources, the reasoning processes that perplexity does. And guess what? Because Google is so Google and... Oh, and just uh, uh, the, the other thing is content. You got to pay for the content, and and perplexity is right now being sued out of their eyeballs by everybody for basically scarfing the content. Meta just signed a, a content a copyright agreement with Reuters, no less. OpenAI is doing the same thing. Google's doing the same thing. So um, I love perplexity. It's a small startup. They, their challenge is to take their amazing product and basically serve it up to eight billion people. That's going to take tens of billions of dollars in compute and, and copyright of things, et cetera. They have a challenge of a startup. And, and, and I love the product, but it's my, uh, my, my mother-in-law is not going to use perplexity. It's, it's too much of an early adopter product. We have to separate what we love as early adopters versus what the mainstream is going to love. And that is, for, for now, it's Google. It's people you know, having access to it because Google pays Apple $20 billion a year. So it shows up whenever, yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, the old uh, Wells Fargo uh, story, right? Wells Fargo's it, at all time highs, despite hating their customers and 50% of people still open their so, bank so statement. I, now. I think the nuance though is like the cost to switch isn't that high, right? Like, I mean, my mother-in-law is like 60 years old. I told her about perplexity and she, she downloads the app and now that's all she uses. Right. It's like, if, cause it's, if it's that good of a user experience, and the cost of switching is not that high. And like, you don't, I don't know if your Google users are that sticky. So but now if, 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 well, let's say everyone's mother's law gets on perplexity, guess what? You know, what's going to happen. Perplexity is going to slow down to a crawl. They do not have the tens of billions of dollars for the compute to serve the results that you're excited about. Yes. Cost of switch is right, but nothing happens. This, this cycle, 
without the compute, without millions of GPUs, you cannot do what Perplexity does. There's a variable cost. Every time you put a query into Perplexity, they're spending five, ten dollars for the voice stuff per hour. Okay, and 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 guess what? Their subscription numbers are five percent. I've checked uh, relative to the free users. The cost. I've I've lived through this with AOL, which went from being nobody to you know forty million people using in six years. The company had no profits. They had a fifteen percent to twenty percent short interest if they went, and they were public. What I'm saying is everything is good. As I agree with you on the switching costs, it's just that this time the one thing we have to understand is that compute drives. Without compute, AI is just two letters in the English language. Without yeah, the I processors, think, we don't have yeah. it. We don't have it. nothing I think works. The, the exciting thing here before we switch topics to crypto, probably Phil, is we're finally arguing about stuff that's good for the consumer, right? Not since you know at the we went 2016, we had SoftBank, we work. And just a shit show of crap, other than Bitcoin and maybe Solana. Okay, uh, we went from an era of Web two, which got Michael, you know, out of retirement to talk about Web two. Parak here uh, from his Goldman Power Money days, and then Michael sat out crypto. It was one of the great minds. Ohm. A lot of the great minds sat out crypto, right? Because it's a money business. It's not a tech company. It's not tech. Right, Bitcoin is software, but it's not a tech company, and it's a it's a money and energy thing, and we can argue about that a little later. But what's great about AI is it's fucking arguable. Like Google has some vulnerabilities, right? Test everybody has vulnerabilities, and everybody's being forced from Elon. Elon's got to wear five hats. As much as I, I don't like his tactics, the fact that this guy has to jump from kissing. Uh, Nvidia's ass to fighting with this guy to battling Waymo to fucking you know is Mars that important in an era where AI matters more? That you know what I'm saying? Like he has to bounce. The good news is he's capable of it. Many people probably wouldn't be able to capable of putting that many hats on. So as, you know, as a non Elon fan, it's great to see him having dance for us and now deal with robotics too. And the fact that Google has to respond to perplexity, which is you know got to survive at an $8 billion valuation. That's something interesting that we can finally talk about. And the fact that my son who battles, you know, just, I, I would say reading problems, and now all of a sudden is a mainstream kid arguing with my wife about legal issues in the back of a car. That's a fucking miracle. So there's some miracles happening in a, because of AI is what I would say. I just Let's want to add on. one more point. Michael, can I just want one point, one, one quick point, sorry. Last to point. Howard, how and then How, yeah. we're moving yeah. on. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, Howard's point on, on, on sun back of car. AI is going to add so much uh, AI uh, uh, IQ capability. We are all going to become smarter. What you're show, talking about is we are getting smarter because of this. And that's actually one of the big things we cannot lose sight of. And last thing I'll say, I'm in pronounced foxhole on perplexity. I love perplexity. We're on the same side it, of this. It's just it, a we've challenge. Got, we've had two. two. Web 2 was a misdirection in many ways of curiosity. Web 2 was a, in a decade of engineers slapping code together, not worried about brand, not worried about, because we had onboarded so many people. So it was great for what it did. AI is about intelligence and curiosity and leveling the playing field to see what I'm starting to see from Waymo to my son's curiosity around topics that would not interest him. Is a magic. This is something that really jumps the shark, and I'm really happy about it. I've been kind of don't like the players, and I don't necessarily like the game, but I'm really liking the results, and uh, that's exciting. All right, next. Sorry, Phil. Okay. Pranav, did you have one last super double final comment there? No, I think a lot of what you guys said are fantastic. The one thing I'll say is uh, my, wife, my wife probably hates this, but perplexity is the third person in our relationship. Because a lot of times in the past, we would be kind of like arguing about things in the world and like kind of like hypothesizing most things. I just pull out perplexity and put the voice thing on, ask it all the questions and debates are settled. So I don't know, it makes us all smarter. That's totally agree. I'll report back. I sent it to my daughter and my son finally and said, please try perplexity just to just to expand. So we'll get some feedback. OK, let's go on the crypto. So Bitcoin, the most telegraphed breakout of all time is fine. It's finally breaking out. JC, let's start here. We're going to get in some really interesting stuff, crypto and the and the election and stable coins in a little bit. But let's just start with Bitcoin just to just to set and appreciate the breakout. 
Uh, JC, we have a Bitcoin chart here. We're over 71,000 now. We haven't made a new high. To your point earlier about, you know, things that make new highs and things that don't make new highs. We haven't. Gold is making new highs every day. Bitcoin is not. But we did sort of break out of this channel here. Uh, and you got the Bitcoin chart. What's your what's your take here, uh, JC? For me, it's 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 the same story. You know, you think I think about Bitcoin as and cryptocurrencies in general as a a another industry group within technology. So when I think about financials and healthcare and utilities and energy stocks, I think about where does cryptocurrency fit? Is it a separate asset class like commodities or bonds, or is it essentially just more tech stocks? So in technology, you've got software, you have hardware, you have semiconductors. You have different types of technology companies that are in different industry groups. For me, crypto is that. And then the bellwether for cryptocurrencies is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is essentially the eighth of the mag eight, uh, if you will, is really how I look at it. And I don't do that because I'm like, I think I'm so smart and I understand the technology so well. It has nothing to do with that. I don't understand any of that stuff. What I can tell you is that it behaves like if it was a tech stock and that Bitcoin is a bellwether for its industry group. It's just how it behaves. So that's how we treat it, right? So if it wants to behave differently, we'll treat it differently. But that's how it acts. So for me, when I look at Amazon, when I look at high beta versus low volatility, it looks like Bitcoin. I mean, just tick for tick. So, you know, when you think about high beta, what is high beta? Almost half of it is technology. And another 20% is consumer discretionary. So you're looking at technology and discretionary as a very large percentage of high beta versus low volatility, which are going to be more industrials and consumer staples, right? And these ratios tend to move in the direction of the overall market. This is risk on when high beta is outperforming low volatility. And when I overlay that ratio with Bitcoin, I mean, call me crazy, but they look exactly the same to me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. So uh, this to me is all part of the same story of Amazon, Google and Microsoft and Meta and Apple have already exceeded these highs. I think all of that has set the precedent and the roadmap for the others. Um, and until the market proves otherwise, like that's the bet. All right. So you think Bitcoin is just I, a matter of time? I, Go ahead, Pranav. This is all you now, Pranav. Uh, so I, I want to talk about uh, how you feel about this and the dominance of Bitcoin, you know, hitting no. kind of, you know, like as someone who invests in the liquid side yeah. of this, how are you feel about this and what are you seeing? Yeah, I'll say a couple of different things and, and we can go in any direction you want. So, um, a, you know, when I look at sort of Bitcoin all time highs, the, that that whole topic, I kind of think about it from market cap because obviously there's more coins in circulation today than even two years ago, right? So we basically touched 1.45 trillion of market cap in March of this year. We're about to hit that, you know, any moment, right? We're kind of back there right now. The difference I'll say this time around is the market's much healthier. So when we were at the current price in March, the funding rates aka how much people are paying to put on levered long positions for bitcoin was north of like 50 percent. so it was all just kind of this fomo money in march driving it funding rates right now are close to 10 percent, which tells you that this is like organic potentially spot demand not levered demand so i think we're in a healthier position at the same price today than we were in march number one uh number two i think people are recognizing that bitcoin is a little bit of a less of an election bet at this point you know Trump is probably better for Bitcoin based on what he said at Bitcoin Miami or say Bitcoin Nashville from it from a few months ago. But, you know, at this point, Bitcoin's kind of in its own category with the ETFs. So people feel comfortable um, generally allocating to this asset class, regardless of how this election kind of turns out. Uh, what they're looking at is global liquidity conditions. So I'm sure you guys saw the headline this morning. The rumor is like China, China's fiscal stimulus might be as much as 10 trillion yuan. That affects the price of Bitcoin, right? What the Fed is doing affects the price of Bitcoin. So, you know, to me, Bitcoin is more correlated to global liquidity conditions and less to do with selection. So people have just sort of like gravitate toward this asset. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, I was just in Asia uh, in, in Singapore in September, and I kind of do this trip every six months and meet just investors in the region. And, and you know, last September in 2023, uh, nobody cared about Bitcoin. They started to maybe ask some questions because the ETF stuff had started. January of this year, when I went back, people that was right around when the Bitcoin ETF was approved, people were actively learning more. And many of them 
in September had started to allocate, but not anywhere near like near their full size, right? They kind of like, you know, starting to allocate. They have dry powder. And they kind of look at it as like I have my, you know, T bill position, I have my Mag Seven stocks, and I have Bitcoin. That's my crypto exposure. So people are almost think about it as their proxy crypto exposure in general. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. I said a bunch of stuff. Is that why you're seeing Bitcoin dominance increasing despite the move, the bullish move? You would think you would see, or in past cycles, yeah. you've seen sort of the opposite. Yeah. So th there are several things. Um, affecting that Bitcoin dominant story. Number one is this sort of ETF slash the only sort of theoretically regulatorily okay asset element being one of them. Um, the other side of it is as something like this gets larger as an asset class, it becomes more accessible for the larger pools of capital to allocate, right? So yesterday you saw some headlines on certain endowments, pension funds owning some of the Bitcoin ETFs. That's the other part of it. The big piece in all this um, is really the regulatory, which is, you know, so far, the regulators have generally in the U.S. have been generally hostile towards everything else uh, or the applications built on, let's just say, Ethereum, Solana, all these blockchains. Um, and that's kind of generally made it hard to allocate to that space, but also made it hard for new developers to come in to build cool stuff. Right. So like a lot of great developer talent is going to the world of AI and building some other things there. And so you've had a little bit of that over the last 18 months. Is that, is that good or bad? So I, just the sheer math behind the Bitcoin dominance, like Bitcoin is already so dominant that it doesn't have to move much to eat into that market cap uh, dominance, yeah. right? So let's keep that yeah. in mind too. Well, yeah. here's my here's my question for you, Pranav, because I'm an LP, so I'll ask you to uh, try and phrase my question. In a world where Bitcoin is dominant, and maybe that's really all it was supposed to be is a hedge and stable coins are the killer feature, um, and Solana's for everything else. Um, is that it, as a, as a manager in this space, how should one think about that? Is there too much capital considering the opportunity? And this is a good thing that I came along to level the playing stakes and, and get proper ask, get proper allocations of capital going or, or where are you seeing the opportunities? Yeah. So, so, uh, I'll lay out a couple of sort of views we have, um, so we believe Bitcoin is really the only product from crypto that has achieved kind of this mass product market fit, right? So you have, you know, 5 billion people on the planet with an internet connection. The number is around 600 million of them own Bitcoin somewhere, uh, even a small amount. So that's, you know, getting to like north of 10% of the internet population on a limited supply asset, that's product market fit. All you're going to bet on is more people buying that over time. And, and, and so then the next thing in line are stable coins. I think something we're going to talk about. Um, over 100 million people now own stable coins. That's kind of like the next thing that's going to go mainstream. And so as someone who's allocating to the space, the question is like, you know, if stable coins are like the aircraft carrier, what are the aircrafts you can invest around that will benefit from that growth? Who are the winners of the stable coin growth story? And, 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 and to us, we're starting to realize, you know, stable coins as a product are really a B2B product. Um, so, yeah, this is a great chart. So, so you know, $172 billion with stable coins out there, basically 99% of that is U.S. dollars. Compare that against the $21 trillion USM2 money supply, right? So, you're, you know, you can just see that chart growing up into the right over time. So, so the, the thing we wonder is essentially as that market cap, let's just say of $172 billion grows to a trillion, who are the winners in the security world or the token world? We're kind of agnostic to either. We just want to pick the winners. And, 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 and our view for a large part of it is it's going to be the fintechs, many of you, ones we, you and I have talked about, uh, Howard, that, are, uh, that currently have users, have a good team, and have cash flow that can essentially build on top of this, right? Like what Stripe did last week is just one example. That doesn't mean you know, the company I'm reading, I'm, re I'm reading up about it now. So Stripe, the company they bought is yeah. pretty cool because it's it actually pretty cool tech. Yeah. yeah, it's well, called Bridge. I, I, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just more referring to like Robinhood being a potential winner, right? Because Robinhood's got the user, it's got the cash flow, they know what crypto is all about, and they can now curate an experience um, for their yeah. end users. I like to say that it's easier for Robinhood to become Coinbase than for Coinbase to become Robinhood. And as I see pumped up funds and spot dot dogs, and we, we talked about this at Stocktoberfest, <laughs> and you, you have to pay to play and you have to learn this stuff. Um, there's only yeah. so much, as much as I love the idea of meme coins, there's only so much until we come up with the value line or Warren Buffett type 
way to study this stuff and, and there's enough app, true applications for it. Bitcoin and stablecoin and a little bit of Solana feels like your portfolio in this place. But stablecoins is interesting because it allows it allows uh, you know Stripe to become Adyen. It allows yeah. It's it's an interesting acquisition because it, you know it's it's payments. It's fucking payments, yeah. and this is a lang stable coins are a language for a whole new generation of people that move money, right? So, yeah. Michael, go ahead. I know I'll, Michael. I'll, go, I'll, go ahead. Go no, ahead. go ahead, Pranav. Pranav, go ahead. I was just going to say one thing on the stablecoin front, right? Um, for stable coins to succeed, you essentially need buy in from three three sort of cohorts. You need buy in from merchants, which I think someone like a Stripe can solve for, or any of the fintechs can solve for. You need buy in from consumers, and day one, it's going to be consumers internationally, not not U.S. people. Like most Americans would be like, why do I need a stable coin? Uh, which is true, but if you're a person sitting in uh, there, you go. That's, that's like a great sort of survey that Castellan put out, which is why are people around the world touching stable coins? Number one is to interact with crypto. Let's put that aside. But number two is to save money in dollars. So most people outside the world, um, outside the US, want dollars more than anything else. And this is an easy way to get them dollars. Once you get them dollars, they probably want to do two things, right? They want to spend it or they want to invest it. So it's, you know, whether meaning, but right now, Stable coins can only be deployed in maybe two things on chain. One is like all the way in the other end of the risk curve, which is meme coins. And then you can kind of say risky crypto assets. And then the complete left end of the spectrum, or safest end of the spectrum are T-bills on chain. So what you're going to see more are tokenized financial products that exist already, right? I wouldn't be surprised if there's tokenized equities on chain one day. And that's where the stable coins will get allocated into. Yep. And I just and want to... Go, go ahead. My, one more thing, Mark, because... I get a hats off to Pranav who runs a crypto fund and we chat all, you know, once a month, let's say, cause there's not much to talk about. But when I t chatted with Pranav a couple months ago, I was in LA walking and I called Pranav for an update on Solana. And we talked about that he added Robin Hood, I don't know, maybe in the teens to his portfolio. And that really caught my attention because he's thinking, cause I've, I, you know, as a seed investor in Robin, who was bullish, 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 bullish. And then, you know, sold it at, at the end of my lockup because I just felt, you know, I didn't see where they were going as a customer, as an actual customer, right? Um, it's a great lesson, Robinhood, and some of these companies that we'll talk about, Philip Morris later, and, and we talked about Axon in the past, some of my favorite trend stocks, Solana, um, because it's been dead a few times, Solana, as, as Robinhood. Uh, you know, Robinhood traded as low as nine bucks, you know, eight months ago, nine months ago, left for dead. And... Um, it's a great reminder of the, like what you say, Michael, with lock in of users. Robin had, had users, they had the degenerate users, and eventually their Chipotle's moment, which was their, their cancer moment with the GameStop passed. And what you were left with, Robin Hood, even though they may not be executing around servicing Howard's portfolio, my portfolio, right, where I want to have trust accounts and I want to have uh, a good desktop app and I want to be able to like put all my capital there, not, not just not just for one feature, but just for the services that I get at RBC or Morgan Stanley. They're not servicing me yet. But luckily for them, the degenerate economy is more important and they're servicing, they can come to me later. So, you know, somewhere, somehow, they're, they, whether by luck or by strategy, uh, I'm not important to them versus Goldman, Morgan Stanley, RBC. I'm their most important person, right? And so Robin Hood scooping up the bottom fucking, the people who are going to end up with all this money, they're 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 scooping them up freely. They just they bought a futures firm, which I would have normally said that's just why waste time on degeneracy. But it allowed them to launch a, a presidential fucking uh, odds product in twenty days that'll be better than poly market ever could be, ever ever ever. And and goes to my degenerate economy thesis of why you got to own CBO, ACME, NASDAQ. These are the guys who truly benefit from Texas exchange opening. God willing, you go invest in Texas exchange, you go invest in poly market. But the depth is going to come from a Robin Hood because that's where the users are, right? That's how liquid markets yeah. get built on top of companies that have 10 million daily active users. And so Robin Hood just keeps getting stronger. And like gold and like Bitcoin, no one's talking about it this time. And as I would say, as yeah, I check my Coinbase account, but I'm going to always have more money in my Robinhood account. Always, always, always. Because I, 
because of just the way the SEC works and the way the United States works. Forgetting the rest of the world, I think their strategy around the rest of the world is stupid, um, trying to build Robin Hood in other countries uh, versus just you know partnering with Alpaca or buying Alpaca and just plumbing the whole world with Robin Hood pipes. But Robin Hood is sitting in an incredible position. What made you take that position in the teens? Like, what were you thinking as a crypto person? Yeah, I think I was going to say, Howard, originally two or three years ago when I looked at this, I was like, yeah, like this is for the degens, right? That people want to go speculate on, you know, they want to day trade a stock or want to day trade some options. Um, but we re underwrote it on our team as customers first, because I'll tell you, like, as someone who's not a degenerate in my personal life, my biggest pain point as a consumer was my private banks, which are the big banks, were not giving me interest on my cash sitting in my checking account or savings account. So I had to always move it to a brokerage account and buy T-bills or have it sit in some money market fund to actually just earn interest. But then if I all of a sudden wanted to buy crypto, I had to like wire the money around like from like, you know, my brokerage account to like a Coinbase or whatever. And so I couldn't do all these things I wanted to do in one place. If I wanted to pay bills, I got to sell my T-bills and I got to move the cash and then go pay. Like, so it was like, I was using four different platforms and then Robinhood gave me a place, one place to do all that, which was I park my cash, I earn my interest, I can buy stocks, I can buy crypto, right? And and I saw them doing that. And then I was like, well, this is going to unlock like the higher value 30 year olds. That was kind of our original point. Because people like me want to do th like these three things, which is own equities, get interest and own some crypto. Um but, you know, with this prediction market thing, they nailed that because the same group of people also want to trade Trump Harris odds. And they're either right now, the only place to do it is Kalshi in the United States. And so, again, you have to move your money out of one place to another. And if you can all do it in one place, that's great. So yeah, power, our view was, look, yeah. And ask an important question, because from a user standpoint, what I love about this, this speaks to what you guys are saying. What about the data side? Because for me, I look at the 24-7 trading. Uh, like the 24 hour trading and I'm getting information from there that I'm not getting in other places. The prediction stuff, again, information, data that we have, like Howard, I think is spot on with the users, but what about the data aspect of it all? Early days of the data, Robinhood's not going to make money off the bat from data. This goes to CBOE, CME. Uh, but to I, be able to provide NASDAQ. that data for oh. users, for advertising, you know? StockTwits is rolling out polls this week, the same thing. And and the data for StockTwits is very important because it's a unique data set. What Robinhood has is a unique data set of people under 35, let's say, right? So, yes. But I think the question is they're focused on wallets, uh, darts everything else will they release this data even if they do you got to think they'll pull it because it'll create like they did the last time they released data let someone else release their data i don't think so, it's worth so, so, someone from goldman data is the most you don't ever touch customers data yeah. you get, they Never. got to be careful as, as oh a my god yeah, but yeah, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. we're seeing the the 24 hour markets action that's data that we can use when they start you can use the it but they can't reshare i don't think they're going to reshare can't reshare but go ahead, I mean, Pranav. Well, well, the, uh, the, th the one thing I was going to say there is like, I think the next natural product extension to the extent regulators will ever allow this is people, like people generally want to use leverage. That's clear, right? People use margin trading for stocks, use leverage in crypto. But there's not a single place right now where you can margin, cross margin your equities in crypto. So to the extent regulators will ever permit that, like that's the killer feature for Robinhood because you got it all in one place. Yeah. yeah. Shout out, shout out to Pranav. I mean, listen, this show's about us talking about trends, but bringing on people that are like nodes in the network and Pranav, man, Ben, he, he also was Kyle's roommate in college from Multicoin. So the, you know, I can't imagine what that college dorm room like is after you guys hit a bong. That must have been crazy. <laughs> you and Kyle, the, um, so the, the man, so, so this goes to my whole thesis of great white sharks, why Michael JC, Alpha Trends, Pranav, um, shout out to one other legend I'm trying to get on, but compliance is, is Justin Sasla. Have you talked to Justin? Justin's at Ribbit, yeah. uh, kind of the quiet, yeah. used to be John Street Capital. He's the one who made me re-underwrite, before I talked to Pranav, he made me re-underwrite Robin Hood at around 12 to 15 bucks. Um, and he's gotten me into Solana. So there's certain people that are nodes in this network that are just traveling in a different circle and playing at a different age and, and talking to a different set of people. Um, and and so, you know, shout out Pranav for, this, for underwriting something that wasn't core crypto and applying it to crypto. But I think Robinhood, 
you know, I think they have energy to like keep going. And then, so where does that do, what does that do when you think about Coinbase uh, as a long or as? Yeah, I think we generally like, um, we, oh, I'll, I'll frame it this way. We think most markets geographically will be two player markets in crypto. So centralized exchanges, you'll have duopoly in the US, you'll have a duopoly in Asia, maybe a third if you're lucky. So, so the question in the US is like, who are the two? Right. As it comes to crypto, because our, our thesis and our strategies look like crypto assets today are two and a half trillion. Global fixed income, global equities are 260 trillion. I think this two and a half trillion dollar asset class will just eat into that 260 trillion dollar asset class for the decade. So who are, just own the winners. It's as simple as that. So, yeah, all these geographies are going to be do all these exchanges will be kind of do all please by geography. A big shout out to one handle, two cups in our chat. He just he, he 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 messaged a minute ago. Made more money from learning from this podcast than almost anything else I've done. Thanks, guys. And pearls, you're looking especially hot this morning. So I just no, want to give not. that little shout He's out. The guy, the guy's a sucker. For now, guy's a okay. Sucker. So I want to ask you. Uh, qu- we're only going to get a chance to quickly get to it, but we got to get to it. Crypto and the election. I mean, the election's like a week from now. It's total insanity out there. And crypto is a part of it. There's, there, 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 it's an element. And you've done some work in terms of the swing states and the, the amount of people yeah. out there, battleground states. What, what are we looking at here? What is this, what is this great slide here? Yeah, so, so I put this together because, you know, my non-crypto friends would kind of generally ask me, like, why do we care about crypto this election cycle? So just to frame things. So on the right hand side is actually a chart I pulled from Perplexity that shows how many votes did Biden win each of the swing states by in the last election? So take Pennsylvania, for example, because, you know, everyone loves talking about Pennsylvania. He won that by 80,000 votes. Right. Um, and so then you look at uh, and the left hand side is data from Coinbase. And I would assume they have a good amount of data, given they are the largest in the United States. So there's 52 million crypto owners in the United States. Six and a half million of them live in battleground states and uh, 1.4 million live in Pennsylvania. So then you flip to the next slide because it's from the same survey. Uh, so then you ask these people these questions, right? So, so 95% of them uh, claim that they'll vote for crypto-friendly candidates. And, and then essentially 67% of these crypto owners are enthusiastic, who live in swing states are enthusiastic to support people who are friendly to the industry. So essentially my point being, you take that, you know, Pennsylvania number of a million something, you know, voters, crypto owners who are also voters, uh, you can assume a lot of them will show up to vote and they're going to singularly vote on this one issue. So hence crypto matters in this case and could also ultimately move the needle in these swing states is the general point. But but they're also going up against half a million Puerto Ricans in Pennsylvania. <laughs> or- I think... This, yeah. I think this is a turnout vote, right? And crypto, the one <clears throat> smart thing that Trump did on of all his fucking, he's just for whatever, get some votes. Or is this is a turnout kind of crowd? The crypto crowd, I think they're a turnout crowd. So, so uh, I, I think the difference between the the Puerto Rican issue and this one again, I'm not a big election expert or anything, but like I would say the d- difference is in 2020 because it's always comparing to 2020. You could make the argument that among the Puerto Ricans living in swing states, they're either on either they're on one side or the other, and most of them are not switching camp. And the, the number of quote unquote independents are are pretty limited. <laughs> in 2020, I don't think Trump got many crypto voters voting for him. Right? He wasn't a crypto friendly president back then. He was so the anti. Was he was anti crypto back then yeah. in 2019. His comments were anti. Right. And now, well, because his, his whole staff was guys who were from Goldman. You know what I mean? Like that that's no longer the case. But yeah, go ahead, Pranam. Yeah, so that's that's the point, which is will enough people, crypto owners, be single issue voters turn out and, and move the needle. So And have you dabbled in meme coins? I have to ask, just because you're a Solana guy. So have you dabbled in meme coins? I'm fascinated by by it, but you're no, not No, I have not, but I, I think there's um there's credence to this argument, I think, that um people need to figure out how to incorporate a meme into their existing like many people in crypto many projects that have an altcoin like really complicate things they don't realize like attention is scarce and people do not have all the time to spend trying to understand their little project and how their token works right so the the easier the meme that like the more likely it is that you will succeed right like if you don't if you ask anyone what's bitcoin they'll say 21 million because that's the meme so like you know solana you know nasdaq 
on blockchain, right? Like everything, like anything that has a very simple meme is going to sell. So, so uh, we, we pay attention to that, which is like, how easy is it to communicate the story? That's, that's just the meme, but we're not going to buy meme coins. So. Right. So Phil, let's move on. We'll bring Helium. Pranav back to, yeah. Oh, quickly Helium. Quickly okay. Helium. Uh, Pranav, what's your take? What's going on with Helium right now? It's a really cool, maybe, maybe just give us a minute on what it is yeah. and then talk about what's going on yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I think Helium is an example of a project that originally kind of started off as this B two C thing and is evolving into a B two B thing, which I think is what most crypto projects will realize. Which is they're kind of good at building quote unquote infrastructure, but they're not really good at building consumer products. That's the general problem with crypto. Um, and so, so, anyways, Helium kind of like basically said to people, put these little boxes in your house, connect to Wi Fi, and it'll propagate service. They they tried several things, most of them kind of failed. The one thing that took off last year was a company called Nova Labs, which is adjacent to Helium, built a cell phone plan, started selling to that plant for 20 bucks a month. And and essentially, they were pushing data from those cell phone plants through the Helium hotspots. When there were no Helium hotspots, they would push it through T-Mobile. And, um, and, and, and while they're doing that, what they're saying to the mobile cell phone users were share your location. So that way, we can kind of deploy hotspots in areas you're using these phones the most. And as a result, they built a pretty deep hotspot network. And if you go to the slide I put together on this, I don't know if you have that up. Um, but recently, they started doing this thing called Carrier Offload Beta, uh, which I think is on my slide. I'll just illustrate what that is. We have it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's up because I don't see it. Go ahead. That. Just go ahead. Oh, I'm we'll oh, sorry. So, so basically, they haven't labeled the carriers, but they basically said to a bunch of carriers, you should think about pushing your data, your cell phone data, through all, through the Helium hotspots. And, and, and essentially, that's the thing on the left, which is they, they've basically called it carrier one, two, and three. They haven't labeled it. But look, I mean, in the United States, there's only like three major carriers, right? Verizon, at and T-Mobile. And so those guys, so when you guys are using your cell phones, some of your data might be going through the Helium network and you have no idea. And that's only possible because they kind of experimented that with that first thing with rewarding you with putting hotspots in your house. And so this beta seems to be working, right? They're onboarding more and more subscribers from the traditional networks. And more and more data is coming through this thing. And the right-hand side is fees earned by the network. So when, you know, these legacy carriers push their data through the Helium network, they pay fiat dollars and that those dollars are used to burn the token. So generally, these things seem to be working. The system seems to be working. So there, I guess my point there is, look, I think there are going to be projects within the crypto world that will find product market fit this cycle. That might be from last cycle, uh, but they'll look a lot different in where they're finding product market fit. JC, is your abuela uh, running a helium node? I got I got a helium in my my wife's grandma grandfather's and one in my grandmother's kitchen uh, from back in the day. I'm an investor in a company called LongFi. So they've been they've been setting up these towers all over the world. Um, so they keep me track on all they keep me posted on on all this stuff. They're, I mean, they're mining a lot. Of, you know, that makes sense. So I'm rooting for it. It's working. Phil's on the phone. So Pranav, let's break to Pranav. We'll have you mm -hmm. back. Stay on, but we're going to break to trends with no friends. Right? Yeah, There's trends with of... no friends. Pranav, thank you so much. <clears throat> Quickly, Riley, we're running out of time. What do you got for us on Treads with No Friends this week? So I know JC has been touching on the strength in mid-cap industrials. So that's where this week's name falls into. Uh, we're looking at Herc Holdings, which is a $6 billion industrial equipment rental company with only 640 followers on StockTwits. Last week, it gapped up 17% and closed at an all-time high after earnings. And now it's just kind of flagging right at those highs. So if we're hanging out here above 200, it seems like the path of least resistance is higher. Um, if you guys want to switch to that next chart, we could take a look at the weekly there and you can see we're breaking out of this massive base going back to 2021. There are so many of these charts. I was just looking at even the Zoom, right? Like that's not all time high, but like there's so many companies that just people have given up on. They may have a lot of followers that just the attention's gone away, whether it's a software company or a new breakout like Herc Holdings. It just this is what this bull market is. I think I think these type of tickers are the new private market. I still feel, Mike, this is a bigger discussion around how broken private markets are, right? The misallocation of capital. The price are too high. 
guys like Pranav are trading liquid securities and tokens. Um, there's so much liquidity that it's if you're not getting a great deal in the private markets, you're the sucker in the room right now. And I just think, you know, it, there's with AI and with FinChat, CoiFin, StockTwits, Twitter, Reddit, there's so much work you can do on your own Robinhood and build a portfolio of like one or two fangs plus 10 or 12 other companies that are small cap, mid cap. And I think we're entering an era where a good storyteller in finance with the following uh, or someone who's doing the actual little bit of research is, is, and that's with free trends with no friends every day. Uh, you can build a, an incredible portfolio that's liquid and, uh, and, and, and has some catalyst. You know, I was looking uh, at, at Philip Morris, guys, you look at, at Philip Morris and, and then we'll let JC go and we'll end this. You it, anecdotally, I know my son's in, I know that there's this on, I know like I'm learning so much about this. I was in Vegas and it just was looking behind the counter at, 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 at all the products that are available to people that smoke or vape. Um, and this, this, this market is blowing my mind, right? Because, uh, it's exploding. So JC, just this again, a trend that had too many friends. It was an obvious trend. And it's, and now Zinn is, is almost as big as the US smoking market. And it's growing at like an exponential rate. So the really fascinating moment, like but in the, um, but the, the slide that's got the performance in September of 18 slide uh, 19 there. So this goes back to September the 12th of 2018 when something really changed i don't know what changed i i looked it up and looked for some headlines to see what what went down there but that's when everything changed between the two so if you guys recall these companies split up in 2008 march of 08 right around when uh when bear stearns was blowing up as a matter of fact and they split into two companies the international business and the local business philip morris, philip morris international 10 years after the split I don't know what happened. Uh, something changed, and it was it was up from there. Particularly after the uh, after COVID, uh, things really got going from there. And obviously, this year has absolutely ripped. So you could really see the difference between the two companies. And I, I think it comes down to the non. I, call, I forget what they call them. The non. The slower death products. I mean, they call it like the the less deathy. I forget the term they use, but it's just so Wall Street. Uh, what they call it. I forget the term they use, but it's just like die slower using Philip Moore, using Philip Morris's Zen product. And I think I broke it down from FinChat. You can go into like a company like FinChat, which Ben Eck uses too, and see the breakout. Much like when I showed the Axon sales, I don't know, the chart's in there somewhere, but and we'll share it post thing where you can just see like with Axon and body cameras and the old Taser product, you can see that like while people are studying Philip Morris as a cigarette and 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 the legal ramifications of smoking there's this other category of products that is just exploding and if you break out the numbers you basically have a catalyst obviously i don't know how the government's going to react to this but um, this is a whole industry unto itself it's going to lead to all kinds of products to help you quit zins um kids are going to go from vaping to zen back to cigarettes i've had friends who have said they started smoking in order to get off vaping i mean in, in a longevity trend, this is just pick your poison. And uh, this is an industry unto itself, whether we like it or not. Probably the captain of the sin industry. Go ahead, Mike. It's, the, it's human nature. People want to do good, but then they do more of the good. They overdo on the good stuff, the relative good stuff. Then they go back to the bad stuff. <laughs> next next show, we can do Beyond Meats versus McDonald's beef and so on. You know, yeah. uh, We'll do the we, E. coli challenge. That's what yeah, Jeff Mackey no, calls it. No, well, what I'm fun. saying is we'll go back to red meat. We always go back to red meat. All right, guys. I'm out. All right, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Adios. Trends with friends. Pranab, thanks for joining the chaos. And we will have you back. Thank you. And, uh, Riley, thanks. We'll see everybody next week. See you guys. Thank sure. you.